Hey, hey, hey now. Welcome back, everyone. This is Matt Pindola with Relative Run Readiness. Today, I have a great guest for you. He is a doctor, which means that he's smart and he knows what he's talking about. So you should listen. What kind of doctor are you, Michael? Are you like a, um, a sports doc? Are you an emergency doc? What kind of doc are you, buddy? I'm a orthopedic surgeon. And I uh, do hip and knee replacement for people with arthritis. So uh, uh, mostly uh, older patient population, but some of them are pretty young. There's a lot of young active people that get arthritis and uh, occasionally need my services. Uh Uh-huh. So when I crack my knuckles, Michael, is that bad for me to crack my knuckles? Does that give me arthritis? Because that's kind of that old myth or wives tale, isn't it? Uh, I don't think you can really do any harm by that, and it's not so much cracking your bones as um, uh, probably the soft tissues around it, ligaments, things like that. I don't think it's a great idea, but uh, as far as I know, it's not bad. Ah, so isn't it kind of like your joints farting or something when you crack your knuckles, like you're releasing pressure and there's some gas or some air that gets released when you do that? I guess that's about as good as an explanation as I've heard. I like that one. <laughs> Leave it to me, right, to bring up farting. And, and uh, no, it's, uh, it's something that I've uh, heard about for a while is uh, when I was a kid growing up that shouldn't crack your knuckles. Mom, of course, tells us that and don't do that. And then I've been cracking my knuckles ever since grade school. Um, I wouldn't say it's a good idea, but certainly I think that my my uh, fingers are still moving. So I think that it's uh, something that was a little bit of uh, a no-no back in the day, like chewing gum and swallowing. You shouldn't do that because then the gum's going to stay in your stomach for like the rest of your life and it'll never digest, right? There's a lot of those type of tales that we get told. I remember being told not to swallow seeds when I was... Um, when I was eating like uh, watermelons and stuff because they could grow in your stomach and watermelon come out of your stomach, you look pregnant or something. And of course that can't be true either, but you know, lots of things I think mom might've told us so that we would, uh, we would do as we were told maybe, right? Well, I think it probably drifts more into parenting and how to keep your kids in line more than anything else that has a <laughs> physiologic basis. Speaking of parenting, you, you have a couple of kids yourself, uh, uh, three kids, right? I do. Uh, well, they're, I don't know if you'd call them kids anymore. My oldest is uh, 32. My youngest is uh, 17. Oh yeah, so you've you've uh, you've been around the block a, a few times now, and you're uh, sixty three. I'm sixty three until next week on Monday. It'll be sixty four. So oh, on Monday. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna have to try to remember that for next week. So you come in and you train in the facility here a couple a couple of days a week, usually on Tuesdays and Thursdays when we we do our training. So I'll have to remember a little birthday card or something for you next week, Michael. But 63, almost 64, you certainly don't look it. We'll post a picture up from your latest adventure, and we're going to talk about that adventure today. But essentially, what we do here in the gym is so that we can enable ourselves to do things that we love outside of the gym, right? That's kind of the purpose, I think, of strength training in general. And and the main goal isn't in the gym, it's outside the gym. So talking to people a little bit about your history first, though, I'd like people to get a better understanding about who they're listening to because, you know, you are um, a great doctor who's got a big um, heart and you have lots of encouragement, I would put it that way, for bettering yourself. And we were just talking before the podcast about determination. So I'd like to talk about determination and embarrass you a little bit. But I know that you didn't necessarily grow up with all the same opportunities as some, maybe more than some and and less than some, but you weren't given anything, I think is the point that I'd like to make here. And you worked very, very hard to become a doctor. And that determination has really served you well. And you continue to use that determination in anything you do, including your strength training in here. But give us a little bit of background. Where did you come from, Michael? What, why did you decide to become a doctor? You know, how did you, how did you uh, take this path, this journey? And how did you get to where you are now? That's a loaded question, but. Uh, Okay. Um, I'm not sure how far back to go, but I guess uh, I, I could tell you a little bit about way back when. I grew up in upstate New York, 
in a kind of rural college town. And uh, I like to think I had a great childhood. It was a lot of fun growing up. We had outdoor activities. I skied every day, played sports, went to a public high school, which I liked a lot and had great friends. And in, uh, in high school, I found I, I kind of liked math and science. I was, probably had a little more aptitude toward it and ultimately led me to go to college and um, study engineering, which I did. And then while, while I was in college, uh, a couple things happened. I got kind of sidetracked. I needed to make some money, so I worked in a lab that was a biomechanics, biomaterials lab. Met some of the engineers and doctors who worked on actually hip and knee replacements, studying them. And I got interested in medicine. Um, my dad uh, passed away at an early age for me, uh, and I think that influenced it as well. And so I, um, you know, uh, had no plans to go to medicine when I was growing up. Nobody in my family was a doctor. But when I got to college, uh, um, I'd say the... Uh, uh, professor who was kind of guiding me through, uh, being an uh, advisor essentially, directed me that way, and it seemed like a good idea, so I applied medical school and eventually uh, became a doctor. I, I struggled a lot the first year of medical school going from engineering to medicine because engineering was um, uh, a lot of problem-solving, you know, you're given a problem and had to figure out a solution, whereas me in medicine or medical school anyway, the initial part is understanding or memorizing a large volume of material without understanding it or, uh, as thoroughly. And then later on, the clinical part comes, which does involve problem solving. So I think the two work together in a, in a productive way eventually, but there were a few bumps in the road. Yeah, sure. And I one thing that I have always loved about you, I've been working with you for well since we reopened the gym after uh, we shut down from COVID. But you've been working with another trainer of of ours before that, and you have a history with us. And I've always loved the fact that you're so humble, even though you could probably tell me a lot more about what is going on with biomechanics when I'm working with you. You're always very respectful to just listen to what I have to say. You perform the drills with with good competency, and sometimes you even give me some really good pieces of information that I can use to better your training, but everyone else's too. So it's been a lot of yin and yang there, and I love the feedback that you constantly give me. But um, for a, for somebody with the kind of background that you have, what I've what I've experienced before is uh, doctors can be a little bit hard to work with or train in some cases because um, they're they're correcting what they think is going on before you have a chance to really see that progression work out in some cases. And with you, you're always trusting the process. You know, you're you're saying, okay, I'll I'll give this a go. I'll see how this works. And so I want to talk a little bit about the training progressions you've you've made and, and how we've been able to work towards this process of your your bigger goals, which is really more around skiing and being able to be in the outdoors and enjoy yourself there with your family. But when it comes to your uh, the medical side of your profession, I know that you had also just come up with different surgeries where you can help other doctors to perform surgeries, maybe with um, a little bit more proficiency or efficiency. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I've worked with, um, you know, my practices, hip and knee replacement. And uh, I do have the background in engineering, and the things have, have the two fields, I guess, have uh, come together pretty well. I've uh, worked with uh, companies that make hip and knee replacement and have developed a number of those processes in conjunction with, with other doctors and engineers. Is usually kind of a team involved in that sort of thing. But uh, an opportunity to innovate or to improve what we do uh, medicine's not a perfect science, and so there's always room for improvement. And uh, it's a field that I feel very gratified to be part of. 
Um, you know, you share a lot with your patients, and there's a tremendous amount of satisfaction, particularly as a surgeon, to see your patients uh, get better and have the capacity to do things that they couldn't do before. Sometimes it's uh, just day-to-day activities, putting their shoes and socks on, walking, working. Other times it's recreational activities or staying in shape, and all those are are, are things everyone can relate to. So uh, on the clinical side, I enjoy my work, and at the uh, part of it is... Uh, hip and knee replacement surgery and the surgical procedures involve implanting a device, a hip or knee replacement, which is a you know, metal and plastic implant that uh, requires uh, some precision to put it in and instrumentation and techniques that are always kind of evolving. Many people don't necessarily see that side of it, but I'm involved in that part as well, and the engineering background has helped. So I've been um, a developer and designer, not only in some of the implants, but uh, surgical techniques and implants. Man, that's that's so impressive. And one thing I wanted to ask you about, with, with all the surgeries that you've done, and I know you can't put an exact number on this, but how how much of this is preventable. You know, I know you can't completely prevent injuries and there are some things that are going to happen whether you train or not. And sometimes genetics can come into play, et cetera. But how much of this do you think can be um, reduced, that risk of having to have surgery? How much of that can be reduced with uh, proper training and recovery and, and those kind of tools that you work on yourself with us here? Well, I, I think there's kind of two areas of that. One is uh, injuries, as you alluded to, which are either repetitive or acute injuries. So acute injuries, you know, if you're up on your roof and you fall off, there's nothing you can do to prevent that. But repetitive injuries, which are uh, more related to cyclic activity, uh, running, or, you know, something you do on a repetitive basis that causes some soreness, those, I think, are uh, probably preventable, but it's not my area of expertise or practice. You're probably more of an expert in that than I am, and I would turn to you for advice in that regard. But uh, arthritis, which I do treat, is uh, sort of in between. I think there probably are some things you can do to mitigate the risk by uh, doing aerobic activity, avoiding excessive uh, you know, uh, weight gain, and... Um, uh, on the other hand, there are some genetics involved that there's nothing you can do about. So it's what we call multifactorial. Uh, uh, I don't think there's anything you can do to completely eliminate the risk, but you can probably help it to some extent just by staying healthy and fit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and it takes a lot of consistency and determination. And that's another thing that uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about today. We were, we were just discussing some statistics and one was just about how some some people will take a longer amount of time to figure out a problem than others before they give up or in the case of ultra running i was saying that what appeals to me about going into a 50 or eventually a 100 mile mountain race you don't know for sure that you'll get through it, right? You'll have some self-doubt. And then at a certain point, I'm sure I'm going to ask myself if I should quit or keep going. And it's that point that I, that I want to test myself and see what I can do when I'm not sure, right? Um, so when it comes to determination, and you have a few kids of your own that are very well accomplished as well and are certainly determined kids, what what do you think we can do as you know as a whole to have more consistency and more determination in other words so we can really discover our why and 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 have a little bit better of a process towards our goals there's a missing link there somewhere right a lot of people don't really know how to get from a to b and along the way there's always going to be some challenges and we can see that as a challenge or a threat 
but certainly there are that's that determination factor that that we have to get gritty at times and say okay i'm not giving up on this what do you think it is that keeps uh people like yourself going what what gives you that type of determination michael well, I think that's kind of a broad question, but uh, uh, I suspect it's related to goal setting and whatever you're doing or whatever you want to achieve, if you set a goal, the goal may be realistic or maybe unrealistic, and it's kind of a moving target. What you were talking about is is running a certain distance. I'm not a distance runner, but I do ski a lot, and I backcountry ski, which is more climbing up the mountain than skiing down. There are definitely times when you're part way up the mountain and you you expect to get to the top and you're kind of wondering if you can do it but if you can see it then there's a, a clear defined goal and it'll help you um, extend your abilities I think a little further if you keep looking up there or if you look a couple feet ahead of you or whatever the immediate goal is it may change from time to time and so I think that um, uh, uh, being unafraid to set a realistic or unrealistic goal is helpful. What I t- tell my kids is your your reach should always exceed your grasp. And um, I live by that, and I always have. Uh, uh, so once in a while you get surprised when your reach doesn't exceed your grasp, and that's a good thing. Yeah, that's that's great. I I I refer to that as kind of like climbing a ladder, right? And so you you have to let go of the rung that you're on to reach for the next one. But it's it's something that it takes a little bit of a leap of faith, but it's something that you can reach for if you keep reaching before you know it, now you're 10 rungs up and then 20. And then before uh, if you realize that you're a lot closer, you're at your goal just by continuing to reach, 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 right? So I like that. And th- this is something that I wanted to talk to you about with your adventure that you were just on. First, let's talk about what you just did in Mammoth. And then we'll talk more about what you did to train and prepare for that. But uh, you just came back from a, a trip in, in Mammoth, right? Sure. I was just in Mammoth for a backcountry ski trip four days in a row. We backcountry skied. And uh, backcountry skiing has become a very popular sport. Most people think of skiing as, you know, you get on the chairlift, you ride up and ski down. And I do a lot of that, have my whole life. Backcountry skiing has become more popular where uh, they make special skis with skins that kind of stick to the snow so you can walk up the mountain with your skis on. And then when you get up there, uh, or if it gets too steep, you can take them off and put them on your backpack, walk up the rest of the way, uh, kind of like a mountain climber almost with uh, spikes or crampons on your on your boots. And uh, the tips of mountains tend to be a little steeper at the t- tippy top than the bottom part. So, you know, you use different techniques to get all the way up to the top of the mountain. And then you can ski down on something that uh, is out in the middle of nowhere that nobody skied before, but I think the uh, the real joy is climbing up and the hike in a part of uh, the mountains that there's no roads. You know, you could maybe get there, I guess, on a helicopter or something. But uh, but backcountry skiing is uh, the best way to do it, and so that's what I did this trip. I, I do this every every uh, now and then, sometimes around Tahoe, and sometimes take some exotic trips. I've actually been to. Uh, uh, some wonderful places. I've been to Antarctica, backcountry skiing, uh, Spitsbergen in between Norway and the North Pole, some of the volcanoes in Chile. And right in our own backyard around Tahoe or Mammoth, we've got uh, similar areas, mountains that go up to about 12,000 feet. So that's what I did this last week. Man, that's... and. I can really relate to that. I love being up in the mountains. What I can't relate to as much is being in the cold that long. I, I'm not, I'm not great with the cold. I don't love it. Um, of course, you know, I've got some, some issues with restriction and blood flow in my hands and my, in my feet. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, Reynolds. Do we, do I say that right? Reynolds? Reynolds. Reynolds. Yep. And that's, um, that's something that I, I've kind of 
suffered from from when I was uh, pretty pretty young and I was stuck out in the cold in a blizzard and then we did some uh, training in the military where my hands were exposed for a good couple weeks and my feet and uh, never really bounced back from that fully um, so I'm always a little bit miserable in the cold but uh, of course they have great gear now and and there's ways around that so I guess I have no excuses but you were telling me something about um, with avalanches this was was just interesting to me that you actually have sort of an avalanche pack that you wear that can protect you. Tell us a little bit about that because that was kind of uh, cool. I didn't realize they had this technology. Uh, they do. When I started this, it was not um, really developed, and uh, now avalanche packs are available. So you you know you wear a backpack when you do this stuff. You have all kinds of safety equipment: shovel, probe, uh, beacon which means, you know, people can find out where you are if you get lost in the snow. And you always go with a group. Usually the more uh, dangerous or exotic trips, I, I go with a guide. The guides are just amazing. I mean, these guys are in uh, superb health. They're sort of genetically able to live up at high altitude. And and then they take us tourists along with them, which is, uh, which is nice for the rest of us. But it's intended to be done safely. And the avalanche packs... Fortunately, I've never had to use one, but it feels good to have it. You can pull this uh, rip cord, and the thing will inflate like a balloon. So if you are caught in an avalanche, it um, you you sort of float up to the top on the snow. And the statistics show that they uh, they improve survival in avalanches. It's uh, it's a good piece of safety equipment to have. And how much all in weight wise? You were, you were saying that there was an extra eight pounds or so in your pack for this? I think so. I think it's uh, uh, about eight pounds, maybe at least six, seven, probably eight pounds. They've tried to make them as light as possible. It might not sound like much weight, but, you know, when you're carrying all this stuff up, you've got skis, a shovel, a, you know, other odds and ends, plus some food, a couple of bars, and water maybe a extra jacket you you look in your backpack for every little thing that you're carrying up and how much it weighs and do you really need it that type of thing uh the other thing you do is you look at what's uh if you got a spare tire around your belly because you're carrying that up too so you want to you want to be as as fit and healthy as you can and prepare for these kind of trips ah so that leads us into why we train right so we have one part you were saying that the eight pounds doesn't sound like a lot. When you have all of your equipment, how how much weight total are you talking about? Uh, it's a good question. I, I don't really know, but I'd say uh, probably 30 pounds or so. 30 pounds. Okay, yeah. yeah. It could be skis, you know, boots, all the other things uh, probably adds up to about that. And uh, as you climb up higher, the air gets thinner. So um, uh, a good rate of ascent is about 1,000 feet an hour. And then you may have to walk in horizontally a couple miles to get to the mountain or something. Uh, and uh, it, it can be pretty tiring. Absolutely. Particularly if you've got a lot of weight to carry with you. Yeah. No. And th so that brings me into the conversation about, reminds me of my hot shotting days where I would have a 30-pound pack roughly maybe 35 pounds. I had a saw that I also had to carry. So this extra weight does add up, especially when you're out there for hours upon hours and you have to hike up to that next ridge line, right? So this is what it's all about is preparing properly for this. And with the training part of things, there's a lot we could talk about, but the relative strength is what's more important as a strength coach to me to to work towards, right? So you have the absolute strength, which is basically like just all out one, two reps of power under six and a half seconds of, of power. But basically, that's something that we do in our training. But our main emphasis is more in relative strength, right? So this is more power economy, in other words, that we are focusing on. So um, we do train you for bilateral movements that are very much like skiing and that's a big staple in your program but we also do a lot of locomotion so uh, when when people talk to me about running and they say well um 
you train runners and uh, I'm, I'm not a runner, you know, I'm a skier. So I guess, um, do you have somebody that would be able to train me? Right. And I, I always laugh at that because everybody walks, right? So everybody, every, and in your case, you're now hiking up these mountains, which is a, a great way to really, I think, enjoy the trip down, right? Because you had to work to get up there. And now it really is that much more rewarding, I think, and, and you enjoy that trip down more so. But looking at locomotion and looking at the aspects or the the efforts that are required, especially with power economy for, for things like this, that means that essentially to me, everybody has to train like a runner in one way or another, or at least for parts of their training, because everybody walks, everybody um, will be hiking for longer distances, or they'll need some kind of power economy when it comes to putting one foot in front of the other. <laughs> so, so that training is important. And then still, even when you're skiing down the mountain, that takes um, endurance as well. So talking about what we did with your training, we could start off with just the, the, the first um, few months where we focused a lot more on stability, right? And we worked on stability mainly around the trunk. And that's obviously what I believe we should all start with. And in fact, I had... Um, just somebody I was emailing back about training and she was asking me about, uh, do I train professional cyclists? And I, and I said, well, of course I train triathletes and triathletes are, are on time trial bikes and, and it's all very similar. But uh, in the beginning, the general physical preparation, the GPP work is really the same to me. I'm training the way your body is moving. I'm looking at those evaluations and seeing where our restrictions are, seeing where we might need more mobility, where we might need more stability. And I don't really care what the sport is yet. At that point, I'm just looking at what the body needs to do to be more efficient. And then we go into SPP work, which is special physical pre preparation. And that is something we worked on more after the first few months. But you spent a good few months working with me just on the GPP. You were very patient. A lot of people aren't as patient in that phase, and they want to get to what I call the bells and whistles. So would you uh, just talk about that, especially with a medical perspective like yours, what did you think about the first GPP phase, Michael? Like, what, what was it about that that might have struck you as different, or was it what you thought it would be? Um, well, it, uh, I just kind of went along with your advice because um, uh, not so much as a doctor, but as just as a regular person, I've always uh, thought of exercise in, in two basic ways. One is uh, strength. And, you know, you go to the gym and you lift weights, and the more weight you can lift, the stronger you are, right? And the other would be cardio, which is you go out and you run or bike, and you measure how good you are by your distance, how far you can go before you, you know, uh, are exhausted. So the way to train, I always thought, was to do one of those two things. So for me, climbing up the mountain would be a lot of cardio, and, and I would get on the treadmill or get on the elliptical to try to prepare for it. Or in my uh, younger years, I was playing football, and I'd lift weights and uh, try to you know improve my performance that way without really any understanding of the importance of other things, like the technique or what you're talking about, uh, core strength, you know, how could there be a relationship between these two? How could strength influence your uh, cardio performance? I, I kind of always thought they were sort of unrelated. And by coming in here, I've learned a lot. Um, uh, you know, the nice thing about the workouts I do with you is that they're very individualized. Uh, you know, you look at what I'm doing, and if I'm doing something wrong, uh, it doesn't matter how much weight I'm working with or anything. I take, you know, you make me take a step back and do the proper technique. So by using a proper technique um, when you work out or exercise, you can train your body to be more efficient. And I've seen the reason I keep coming back is I, I, I see the results. You know, I go out and I ski and it's less effort for me now. 
Um, even though when I'm in here working out, I'm not dripping sweat at the end of the workout. I feel, you know, pretty good and, and that it's more a way of making my body efficient. And uh, I never realized that, you know, if you're doing a pull-up or something, you use other muscles than your arms. I thought you just grab on and pull and see what happens. <laughs> and I think those are sort of intuitive, but uh, the progression you described is a way of using essentially other parts of your body to assist uh, your performance in one task to make it as efficient as possible. And so this occurs to me with downhill skiing where I'm more efficient, less effort, I don't feel as tired, and uh, I can do more, same as climbing up the mountain. So I see those differences even as a guy at my age and maybe – you know, a guy my age, you see these differences more because, you know, things get harder as you get older. Um, and uh, uh, that's been the real turning point for me and the benefit in in uh, what you do. Nice. Yeah, well, in training, first, we talk about capacity. When we improve our capacity, it's just takes less oxygen to do the same thing. So as we get stronger, that's relevant to now the conditioning aspect of the cardio, right? That supports that. I don't train your skill sets for, for skiing. That is something that you have a long history in. But what my goal is, is to improve your capacity to hold on to your positions longer without losing the endurance without losing the capacity to hold those positions as you keep skiing, right? And so that's, to me, it boils down to a pretty simple equation that when your body's able to increase on the fatigue index, when it's able to increase the amount of time it can be under tension without defaulting, then that's going to cross right over to your skiing. And so when we look at the capacity for you, it was a lot of it had, I think, to do with your history, too, as a doc. And the reason why I say that is because when you had spent a lot of time just researching and and I don't want to blame everything sitting on a desk, OK, but uh, at a desk. But in other words, we had some things there through your shoulders, through your spine that we wanted to strengthen those positions and increase the mobility in those positions. Right. So just something as simple as reaching overhead with with your uh, single arm, we were looking at restrictions there for your shoulder, right? And then how can we get that mobility back? How can we restore that mobility, right? So we had to look a lot more at the basics when it comes to spinal work. For example, I call it spinal tap, right? But we're flexing, we're extending, we're doing rotation, we're doing anti-rotation. We're looking at these different aspects and variables to see where the defaults seem to be coming from. And as we started to gain essentially more stability around your trunk, you were starting to gain more mobility through your hips and your shoulders, right? And that's, that's something that as a doctor, I know you had given me a lot of really good feedback, uh, progressions that you felt like were really working well for you. And I've been able to even take some of that and improve upon those progressions for other athletes. So I, I always appreciate your feedback on those sort of things. But it was also about... Uh, uh, making sure that we're really following the lines, if you will. So I, I kind of think of them as um, in the term of an athlete and how an athlete is going to perform. Most of the time, the muscles you can see in the mirror, those are you know, usually the ones that are going to be a little bit more dominant and those need to be a little bit more worked on with mobility. And then the muscles you can't see in the mirror, those tend to be the areas that we have to work on more stability. And in your case, that was certainly true. I, I think that, again, years of your practice and putting in a lot of time in sort of these these uh, positions where you were flexed for long periods of time through your spine, that's not necessarily 
necessarily a bad thing to me that you uh, sit hunched over for a while, but then we need to change position in our spine, right? So I was looking at just the long-term effect of that, right? Something that was um, cyclic, something that had built up over time. So we did that for a good few months. We worked more on improving the stability around your spine and then really working on the back line of your body and increasing the strength capacity for endurance so you could hold positions longer. And that certainly opened up and freed up range of motion for you through your shoulders and your hips. We've seen um, a really a chain effect happen there throughout your body. And even with your ankles, those those seem to be kind of the, the last to really improve. But now we've gotten to the point where we can do plyometrics and we can do really good reactive drills where we have good ankle stiffness, we have good uh, arch stability, we have excellent ankle mobility now. We've even tested and seen that your ankle mobility has improved um, quite a bit. So just talking on that and getting into this next phase of your training, it is more SPP. It is more specific now for your sport and you're doing wonderful with these progressions. But what what's your view on on this progression now with SPP versus GPP? How How is it different for you? Well, I uh, just take a step back because I almost forgot about that where we started. And I think I'm not the only one. I don't think the human body was meant to be uh, sitting down, you know, staring at a computer screen all day. But that's kind of the world we live in. <clears throat> and um, I'm sitting down either, you know, uh, in the office or operating. Uh, and you develop habits. Uh, it's more lifestyle than anything else. I think lifestyle is important for staying healthy and fit, just the way you live your lifestyle rather than, you know, relying on your gym experience to take care of all your health needs uh, uh, two hours a week or whatever it is. And so the first part was improving the mobility, um, and that did uh, uh, kind of set me up for the next phase. And also uh, made me feel better. I, I wasn't, you know, convinced initially that uh, the mobility and stability would really make a difference, but it, it did and it allowed me to get to where I am now. Oh, nice. Well, yeah, and just I know everyone has different experiences and backgrounds with, like you said, we all probably sit a little too often, right? A little too much. But um, I I just try to make sure that I'm getting up and moving around. I do more programming now than ever. So if I can just get up and, and walk around for a few minutes, I always feel much better. And of course, it's a chance for me to just allow the spine to move again. Um, but I'll just try to do little things like maybe I will put a towel behind my lower back and purposely get into more extension for a few minutes and then I will allow myself to even round out for a few minutes and then I'll put one leg up so I have you can see right here at the so you can see I'm not full of it Michael right there you yeah. guys can't see it but I have a little uh, slanted step where I can put my foot up while I'm working and then I will switch feet and that also allows for some flexion of the spine laterally as I do that as I hike one hip up and then the other. So I just try to move around in different positions there. So I'm glad that you uh, talked about that a little bit. But when it comes to your experience with uh, mobility and gaining more mobility, I think that we've found you're, you're moving better uh, than, than probably safe to say than you've moved in the last decade or so, right? I'd agree with that, yeah. Okay, and and the reason why I uh, say that is because you know I don't have you do a lot of stretching, and this is uh, this is just something I wanted to bring up because <laughs> it seems like um, a hot topic. I have always said I think stretching has its place, and of course, especially if you consider it to be more meditative and things that you want to do towards the end of the day to wind down your day, fantastic. But to me, we really have to look at gaining stability in order to increase mobility. So if we do something that increases our stability, then we go into movement patterns that require more range of motion and we train under load and we get, in other words, under mechanical loading, 
with weights or with resistance of some sort. It can be bands, weights. It can be your body weight with something like a push-up and doing a hand-release push-up where your hands now leave the ground at the bottom and your elbows have to travel past your ribs, right? So there's all different ways to do it. But to me, that's strength stretching, I call it, right? And that's that's how I, I encourage that. And there's a topic about reciprocal inhibition that we talk about where if one side is firing on all cylinders, the other side will have to relax. And so that's kind of where I look at more long-term advantage of being able to get mechanical loading going for more mobility. Um, and what do you think about that, though? What's your opinion on that subject? Well, I, I would uh, relate it to what we call in medicine um, passive range of motion and functional range of motion. Or, you know, some people think of it as active range of motion, which is when your muscles are moving a joint. And passive range of motion is when you're just passively stretching it, like uh, yoga, when your muscles are, are kind of relaxed and you're sort of stretching the joint. So what that does is that gives you mobility in the joint, that passive stretching, and it stretches the muscles. But what's most important for function or functional range of motion is um, uh, active range of motion of the joint. So it, it's not necessarily the full extent of how far you can bend the joint. For instance, one way I, um, you know, talk to patients about this with their knees is uh, if you want to kneel, uh, maybe with your heels all the way touching your butt, your, your knee has to bend pretty far. And so that's kind of a passive motion. But if you get up from that position, you don't really use your muscles. You sort of lean or rock forward to your knee gets to about <clears throat> maybe 100 degrees or 90 degrees, which would be a right angle. So a little past that, and then your muscles engage, and they can contract and assist the actual locomotor function of standing up. And in uh, activities, which is what you really want to achieve, it's that functional range of motion that's more important than the passive range of motion. Um, I think the passive range of motion or yoga type activities, there's nothing wrong with those. Those are uh, healthy, particularly for meditative purposes and to get more mobility of a joint, uh, particularly if you have some deficiency that way. But uh, for me personally, it's the more active motion or functional motion that I want to achieve to improve the efficiency of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, no, it's and that's that's great to get. Just a a point of view from from a medical perspective on that because this is something that I'm always talking about. What you just what you just said there makes complete sense. It's what I think ties in well with the next part of our conversation and that's just looking at shelf life and longevity and being able to do this not well, you started training with us because you started to have some of these restrictions and because we wanted to get out of uh, pain and you wanted to be able to get into, um, you know, better positions essentially and hold those positions longer like we talked about. But when we look at shelf life, being able to save your joints, if you will, being able to keep your stability so that you are moving freely, but without the friction, without the um, degrading the joints at all, right? That's, that's something I know is important to, uh, to you. And, and long term, you want to be able to do this in 20 years still, right? I'm hoping to, you know, there's nothing you can uh, do to slow down the aging process. But my goal is to stay as healthy and fit and active as I can for as many years as I can. And I think most people, uh, share that same goal. Yeah. What, what you have insane looking calves. I should post a picture, um, with you doing calf raises, especially when you do bent knee calf raises, right? Your, your soleus is just like ridiculous. Um, because you were, um, you were a competitive, uh, skier, but you did jumps, right? I did. I was a Nordic jumper, so it's more like, uh, Eddie, the Eagle. I wasn't great at it, but, uh, but I did the best I could. And, uh, it was pretty exhilarating uh, experience back in the day. Yeah, and but it's hard on the body, and you have some um, 
you, I, probably some of the restrictions that you were experiencing came from some of that trauma, right? Because there's more than a few times where you, uh, your body went through essentially a, a car accident out there, right? Yeah, it, it is definitely one of those things. What goes up must come down and uh, doesn't always come down the right way. <laughs> That's a good way to say it, right? So, so you know, with that, I, I just wanted to point that out too, because th- no excuses. I mean, I, I, I hear a lot of times people talking about how, well, I used to ski, but then I, I beat my body up and I went through a couple really bad accidents and now I just can't anymore. And that's just, you know, to me, of course you can, you just have to take the you know, take the steps and you have to be patient maybe, but you can get back to what you love to do in most cases. I mean, there's always exceptions to the rule because there are some traumas that are, are tough to come back from, uh, because there's too much that, uh, was, was damaged. Right. But, but in a lot of cases, I think we can come back from these things and we can train properly. And that concept of progressive overload, where you're reaching for that next rung, you know, that that's always, to me about consistently reaching, consistently reaching, but not consistently overreaching, right? So what you were saying before is, um, I think you got that next rung that you're reaching for and you're able to keep climbing, but sometimes you fall, right? And you fall a few rungs and then you have a choice to make. Am I going to start reaching for that next rung and get back up there, right? So you have the choice. And I think that with somebody like you, it's a prime example. I mean, I'm so proud of the progress you've made. And I think I, it's safe to say now, but when I, <laughs> it's okay to say it now, but when we first started working together, I was like, man, uh, he, Michael's, you know, kind of a mess here. Right. But, <laughs> but I could tell, and I'll, this is now where I'll compliment you though. I could tell on day one that we were going to make progress just because of your determination. So I keep getting back to that. Right. So, uh, you know, you're humble, you listen to what I have to say, uh, even though, again, you could probably school me on some things when I when I talk about joints and movement and you might be, uh, thinking, okay, uh, this is, um, this is my area of extra expertise more than yours, but I'm going to listen because I haven't I've been doing it this way yet. And so again, I think you're very humble like that, but what keeps you so humble and determined? I know you probably don't want me to say it that way, but you are, you're humble and you're determined. What, what keeps you that way? What, what keeps you grounded, so to speak? Well, I don't really know. It's just kind of the way I am. I I think that uh, nothing was really handed to me early on, and and so um, you know you sort of figure out. Nobody really cares about what you do or what you don't do. It's kind of up to you. Um, and uh, uh, if you complain about things, nobody really cares either. So it doesn't really gain you that much. Um, and ultimately, the goal setting we talked about is is kind of an individual thing, and there's a tremendous amount of satisfaction. You feel good when you achieve those goals, and it is sort of a moving target. You were talking about um, uh, recovering from injuries. One of the nicest things or uh, gratifying aspects of my clinical practice has been if I have a, a passionate skier uh, who's got arthritis, and I can really relate to that. And 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 it's a common story about, you know, how frustrating it is. They can't ski the way they could before. Two three runs, and their knee or hip hurts. And then after a joint replacement, they can actually go back to it. Uh, they may set a little different goal, you know, um, and not ski as aggressively as before. And and we'll talk about that. You know, if you ski in the softer snow or in the trees, avoid big crowds and stuff. Uh, as a different kind of goal-setting type of skiing you want to do after a joint replacement that is very achievable for many people and a tremendous amount of satisfaction in that. I also think as you get older, you know, your goals change a little bit, but uh, still that basic philosophy as you reach and exceed your grasp, even as you get older, is an important one to maintain. Yeah, well, just today we as I said, are working more on SPP type of drills. And you were doing one reactive box drill where you end up tripping, falling over the box. And 
although that certainly is not something we want to have happen, again, looking at your reaction to that, you just got right back up and brushed yourself off and then went right back into trying it again. And again, it was not something where you were uh, too fatigued or, but it was a coordination thing that you had to get down. And this is the first time we started working on this particular box drill. And you were able to get that down today because you didn't give up and you kept that, that determination almost like, Hey, you know, I'm, almost like you were glad that we were doing something that was challenging you uh, to the point where you could, you, you could end up falling, right? Well, I, I like that attitude. Well, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. But if you talk about goal setting, we're talking about the upper end of goal setting. There's actually a bottom end, too. And so if you uh, try to do something and, you know, you kind of flounder around and you say, oh, that's ridiculous, I should be able to do that, that's, that's sort of the bottom end of the goal. And, and I think that bottom end, you know, so goals are probably, I guess, never really thought about it till now, have an upper and a lower end. And the lower end is when you say, you know, this is pathetic, I should be able to do that. Um, we don't think about that one as much, but it does come into play once in a while where it's almost embarrassing that you can't do something. And then there's, uh, I think, uh, almost an uh, instinct to figure it out and just do it. Yeah. Well, and so I love that you brought that up. I want to, we can finish with that because when I, when I was talking about first starting to work with you and we couldn't get into overhead extension, we certainly weren't going to get into any plyometrics right away. And yet now you look six months into this and you're doing all these things. We're, we're even working on pull-ups. You did some overhead thrusters today with really good extension. You're doing uh, plyometrics. Your ankle positioning is, is really, really um, functional and you have the stability, the mobility throughout your chain that you need. So you're very reactive. And so you're moving more and more like an athlete um, and the athlete that you are today is certainly maybe the best version of you since you were a kid, right? So I look at those things and say, okay, because when we try to do these overhead positions, for example, and because you know that you have some restrictions or you've gone through that process of stability for better mobility, but now you have to learn how to, for example, use the lats more, not just your arms in that pull-up. It's never just, well, I can't do it, so let's just move on to something else. You're always very determined to say, okay, well, <clears throat> this is this is a little bit out of my reach, like you were saying, but what can what can I do to get there? Right. And and again, you're always good about listening to me there. I say this movement might not even look exactly like a pull-up, but it's going to get you there. Right. So we're going to work on scap retraction. We're going to work on horizontal rows. Then we're going to start to do eccentric pull ups, et cetera. And now you're able to actually get into these positions because you took the time to go through the progressions rather than just saying, yeah, I can't do it. Let's just forget about that. And then you'd be surprised, Michael, but there's um, a lot of people that just put that block up and they don't see I like what you said, the lower end of goals. They don't see that you have to accomplish every step, even the lower end of things in order to get to that higher goal you want. In fact, it's obviously going to be impossible if you don't, right? So I like how you said that, is that we have to be humble enough to to look at those lower uh, end goals and just say, you know, I should be able to do this, but reality is that I'm struggling with it and I need to focus on it if I expect to be able to grab that next rung, right? Yeah, absolutely. The other uh, point that you raised um, that may not have been uh, fully appreciated that, that I've learned is uh, in our day-to-day -day activities, we use the body parts that are most efficient to do whatever it is we're doing. There's actually a lot of little muscles in your body that most people don't ever know the names of. They don't, you know, uh, look that great if, you know, you don't do anything to make them uh, bulk up or anything. But these little muscles in your, uh, around your spine, around your shoulder girdle, even your uh, uh, abdomen, probably even more so in your abdomen, which is what gives you your core strength, are incredibly important. 
And the only way you can strengthen them is by specifically isolating those muscles and and, uh, using them. But once you figure out how to use them effectively, then your body becomes much more efficient. Yeah, that's right. I kind of refer to that process as we start off with more optimization, and that's done with the assessments to look at where we need to optimize more, and then we go into activation, and then finally we can go into integration, right? So then, as you just said, now these muscles are firing when they should fire, right? And you have the right order to things, especially when it comes to those deeper abdominal muscles that are going to provide more stability around your spine. But when you start doing those integrated movements, total body integration type of movements too soon, then I think we tend to say pop the top, for example, when you're reaching overhead and your ribs flare, because we didn't take the time to to really optimize those positions first. And it's kind of like uh, crawling, right? You start off as a as a baby where you push yourself up off the ground, you look around, that's the first step. And then you have to get uh, on your hands and knees and, and learn to do things with uh, that, uh, essentially your first steps in locomotion, right? And you, and, you, and you finally are able to walk and then run. So training to me is very, very similar. But I think most people, when they're training, if you really look at their programs, they're running and they haven't learned to crawl yet. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, it's understandable. You want to get to where you're going. Um, I, uh, I, I, I look at some of what you're saying, almost analogous to say a golf swing and you can, you can be a kind of mediocre golfer, which I'm probably in that category or average and, uh, go to the driving range. And you think, you know, the more you go to the driving range, the better you're going to get. Well, if you keep doing the same thing over and over, that's not efficient or correct it actually isn't going to make any difference and then you know the pro comes out and he shows you what to do and if you can actually do that um it will change the muscle memory and you're using different muscles or doing things differently uh, which will make a meaningful effect on the outcome and it's the same thing that you're talking about that these um these aren't very intuitive so for me, I, I, I uh, was like anybody else. You figure out, well, you know, I need to be in better shape. I'll just go to the gym. Well, what I need somebody to help me, at, you know, lean over me, tell me what to do. You just go to the gym and you, there's the weights, there's the machines, you know, you just get on it and go. Um, but there's quite a bit more to it than that. If you really want to do it properly and have that gym training translate to uh, healthier lifestyle and uh, doing more efficient activities and having more fun out there in the real world. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, I started by training your son, Sasha, which he's an amazing skier himself. And um, that was, I thought that that was the, uh, the end of, of training the, the rices, right? And uh, then you, you came along and I certainly see where Sasha got a lot of his discipline and his athleticism and, and those type of things. But when I started to work with you, I started to understand really more of your background and, and what you actually did as a doctor and, and how you influence what, what you do on the rest of the community in, in ways that I think some people don't really think about. Like when you, when you talk about progressions and when you talk about dedication, when you talk about um, just, you know, never giving up on yourself, th- those, those words are pretty weighted with a guy who's accomplished as much as you have. And I always really appreciate the time you give me to start talking about articulation of a joint and why a particular movement will be maybe more beneficial than another one. And, and so again, you know, I've been able to improve my my capacity as a strength coach because of because of, of of you and because of the things that you're willing to share with me and I just I think that that's the the, the main thing that I respect the most about you Michael is that we I never feel when I'm training you I never I always feel like I am 
uh, respected. I'm in charge of the situation. I, I never feeling like back on my heels, like I, maybe I'm going to say something wrong or I'm not going to give you the right progression because, uh, you're going to be critical of, of me not thinking about, uh, you know, a, a various aspect that, that you might know more about, but you never ever make me feel that way. I always feel like, um, Michael's going to give this his best. And if there's something that we need to change, it's, uh, uh, it's a communication and it's not because you're refusing to do something. It's because we're both agreeing that maybe there's something else that could help you more. So, you know, I, I appreciate that so much about you. And I think that we all can be a little bit more, um, you know, humble. Uh, and I, and I take that cue from you. So I, I appreciate you so much and I'm so proud of your progress, Michael. And, um, just anybody who is interested in, um, getting to that next level for themselves, which should be everyone listening. I think just looking at examples like Michael's really helps us all helps me, encourages me to push myself that much more, to know that much more, to be able to put that much better of a program together. It keeps me on my toes, but in the best ways possible. So I appreciate you, Michael. Thanks for coming today, talking to everybody. And um, if I can have you back for another podcast, we talk a little bit more maybe about your next phase of training. That'd be wonderful. Sure. Be happy to do it. And thanks for training me, Matt. Oh yeah, absolutely, brother. All right. Till next time, guys. Okay.